Hello, I'm Luca Torix, and welcome to my Moors Faction Guide for Medieval 2 Total War. Today we'll be discussing the faction of the Moors, the Islamic faction. We'll be discussing some campaign strategy, the units, and various other stuff in this video. So, the Moors is a faction based mostly in North Africa, but you can see they have a small settlement in the south of Spain. To the south and to the east of them, just get my direction sorted out there. To the south and east of them, a lot of rebel territory. So a lot of potential to expand if you're the Moors. Up north, however, a little bit more congested with the Spanish and Portuguese near you. So that's something you need to have a look at. But yeah, it's this orange region here. Like I said, Moors are Islamic, which is something you need to take into account. The religion is more important in Medieval 2 than in other games. To win the long campaign, you have to hold 45 regions, including the Jerusalem region, around here, and the Toledo region, I think that's how you pronounce it. Basically, it's a Spanish region, we'll talk about that um, in detail in a minute. The strengths of the Moors can field a good mix of light cavalry and infantry and effective spears. Weaknesses lack strong late period units. So, what I'll do first is I will show you the different units of the Moors and we'll discuss them. Okay, so these orange geezers are the Moors, and we'll start off with peasants, which we always do. One attack, one defense, one charge. Poor morale. Basically, yep, yeah, just don't use peasants unless you're using them for cannon fodder like it suggests in the description. But basically, peasants are pretty useless. There's going to be very little need for you ever to use them because they're trash. We'll move on to town militia, and I discuss these guys every time as well. These guys are certainly a step up from peasants with attack 5, defense 7, and charge bones of 2. They're not amazing, but they are sort of units that are good in the early, early game at defending towns if you just need a small bit of garrison as a sort of fail, say, just in case a random army comes and attacks you. Town Militia will do a decent job at just holding a city against very, very basic early armies. They're pretty cheap to maintain. They're all right, but they're nothing spectacular, that's for sure, basically because they're not very advanced. Then we'll move on to Spear Militia. Now, these guys look pretty similar and they are they actually have more in the unit like you can see there but attack five defense seven charge bones two arms with long spear but little armor like it says there bonus fighting cavalry because spear militia and any unit that has a spear has a bonus fighting cavalry so again a defensive unit particularly effective in defending cities i would say then we have the Nubian spearmen, natives of North Africa. That is something I know from Rome Total War. Um, early period troops, useful for guarding flanks, it suggests here. These light troops are armed with a spear, but little to no armour. So if you want to use Nubian spearmen like it suggests, basically what it's saying is, um, if you have a line of spearmen, you can have some Nubian, flearmen, uh, <laughs> Nubian, flearmen? Nubian spearmen on the flanks, just as a sort of protection measure because sometimes cavalry likes to flank you if there's a unit of spearmen on the sort of side or flank then they're less likely to get behind your spearmen because if a unit of cavalry gets behind your spearmen you're pretty much screwed because they're pointing their spears the wrong way so nubian spearmen good for just sort of protecting flanks like it says a decent defensive unit with nine defense but nothing spectacular they're light however so they're going to be faster moving than these geezers for example Next up, we have Berber Spearmen. I think that's how you say it. My pronunciation has never been great. Armed with spears, these troops can give attackers a nasty surprise, although they are susceptible to prolonged melee attacks. Attack of 7, defense of 9, can do a Skiltrum, which is a defensive formation similar to a Phalanx. Combat bonus in deserts, where well, you're going to be fighting in deserts a lot this campaign, so that's pretty decent as well. But very, very similar to the Nubian Spearmen. And again, Nubian Spearmen, not great in prolonged melee attacks because they haven't got the defense or the strength to hold it for that long. But these guys will do a decent job in their attack because they've got seven attacks. Okay, they can give a nasty surprise. But honestly, they're very similar to the troops we've just looked at. Then we get on to dismounted Arab cavalry. So they're not cavalry, they're infantry, but they're dismounted. Get it? Arabs from the towns and cities throughout the Middle East. That's all the description you get for them. Attack of 7, defense of 13, charge bonus of 3. So they're actually superior to the units we've just looked at, but there's not a lot to them. They can't form a skill drum. They haven't got very long spears. They're sort of, it's, it's an odd unit, but they've got a tiny bit of armor, as you can see there. They're not quite as bad as peasants, for example. They're, they're, they're a solid unit, but I, it's just not one I use that often, to be honest. Then we have dismounted. Tureg, sorry if I said it wrong, fierce and independent nomads armed with a spear but little to no armour. My knowledge of um, North African nomads is not brilliant which is why I cannot pronounce their name. 
Anyway, attack of 9, which is pretty solid. You compare them to these guys, much higher, which is good. Uh, defense of 10, charge bonus of 4, which is pretty high as well. Good morale coupled with good stamina means these guys will be able to survive that prolonged melee attack, which, for example, these guys couldn't, like the games had said it, they couldn't. But more morale, better stamina, they're less likely to route and break, which is a really good thing, of course. And, of course, bonus fighting cavalry. Then we get on to... Lamtuna Spearman. Fierce and disciplined Saharan Berber, so similar to the guys we looked at before, armed with spears. And these guys are pretty similar, but these guys, good morale, very good stamina. All these troops are relatively similar, if I'm being brutally honest. But 9 attack, defense 10. They're a solid unit. Nothing amazing, but they can form a skill trim. They're decent in defense. What you'll notice is there's a lot of similar units here and they don't get massively better. If you compare them to the spearmen of, let's say, the Italian factions, these are like inferior, particularly the late game lads, are inferior. They don't really progress as much. The only thing that progresses is the morale from the sort of not very good sort of average morale over here to very good and good morale over here but there isn't a huge amount of progression in terms of defense in particular now spearmen are meant to have good defense and for high period spearmen to have 10 defense isn't exactly amazing and this is bringing back to what i said at the beginning of the video which is late game troops not as good for the moors then we get on to the swordsmen so urban militia on with the sword and well trained, protected by heavy armour, these troops are far superior to most militias. Attack of 11, defense of 18, but these are late period troops because they have good armour, you can tell that, They're, they are well armoured, you can see that just from the picture, and that is evidenced by the 18 defense. Now these guys are a lot better defensively than these lads, even better offensively as well because they're not spearmen, they are less of a defensive based unit. But the thing is, in the late game, lots of lads have good armor it's nothing particularly spectacular comparative to other factions at this point in the game but still comparatively to these lads they're pretty good then we have the dismounted christian guard christians fighting for the moors yeah i know right these elite troops resemble the western knights of the time attack of 16 defense of 22 good morale and well armored and generally any troop that is sort of loyal to a religion or a some sort of fanatic or uh, crusading troop or anything like that they tend to have good morale because they're fighting for a cause, damn it. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. They're fighting for a cause. Therefore, they have good morale. 22 defense. These guys will be tough to break down. 16 attack as well. They certainly pack a punch. They're good. But, again, they're late period troops. You're not going to be able to get them before these guys, that's for sure. Now, Hashashim. Hashashim? I've probably offended so many people in this video already. I'm trying my best, okay? Anyway, they are a semi-religious sect of stealthy assassins. On the battlefield, they fight with a sword and shield. I believe you can get these guys from the guild. The, is it the Hashashim guild? You can get these guys from. That's how you get them, I think. Attack of 16, defense of 21. So similar to these guys in that respect, but not as well armored. So they're more vulnerable to missiles, let's say. Very good stamina, good morale. So they're a solid troop. What I do notice immediately, though, is half of the amount of soldiers in a unit, which is not something I like. Units, and I always compare them to the Arcani of the Rome Total War. Arcani on paper are really, really good, but the fact that they have basically barely any people in a unit means that really they're not hugely effective in a large battle. These guys are fairly similar, stealthy, assassin -y troops, but again, you know, they're not, they're not hugely effective, but if you use them specifically well in certain situations they can be vital because they sort of can be a shock troop they can get a unit routing so if you're dealing with a tough unit these guys coming in they could screw everything up for the opposition which is exactly what you want but i wouldn't rely on them on a day-to-day -day basis that's for sure you won't even be able to get them on a day-to-day -day basis so it's kind of irrelevant saying that to be honest then we have crossbow militia a um, bit of an odd order i would have thought they would have put the archers first but whatever crossbow militia local militia armed with crossbows and some armor Good for ranged combat, but will melt away in melee. So that's a little bit harsh because they actually have a defense of 8 and an attack of 6. They're not too bad in melee, but they're not a melee troop. So that's basically what it's saying. They are a missile troop. Missile attack of 9 is pretty solid. Effective against armor is good as well. And when you go further and further in the game, obviously more and more troops have armor. So it's more and more important that crossbow troops and musketeers, etc. have that damage against armor otherwise they'll be completely useless these guys aren't useless because they can attack against armor which is nice 
Then we have the Sudanese Javelin Men. Good for weakening units and breaking up formations, but will quickly dissolve if caught in the melee. So again, they're not really melee troops, they are Javelin Men after all. Six missile attacks, so they're inferior to what we just saw, but they are effective against armour. And I believe Javelin Men to be effective against armour, that seems quite rare to me. I think that is quite rare, so that's pretty good to see. And of course, combat bonus in deserts because they are natives of Sudan. Then we have Desert Archers. I would have thought they would have shown the archers before the crossbow, but it doesn't matter. Hardy men from the deserts, uh, adept with the bow, but lacking the equipment for close combat. You see the theme here? The theme is decent missile attack. These guys actually have long range missiles, which I love, and flaming missiles, which lowers the whole morale of the opposition. The long range missiles are great because that means they can hit from afar. You can start hitting the opposition before they can start hitting you. It's a big, big bonus, particularly in city sieges. But attack of six, defense of six, they're not that good in the melee. And of course, they have no armor. So, you know, whatever, you know. But you're not going to be using these guys in the melee. So that's kind of a redundant point. Then we have peasant crossbowmen. I don't know why they're showing the peasant crossbowmen last. Whatever. Wearing little to no armor, armed with a crossbow. M missile attack of 12, which is good. You can see it's much better than the other troops you've just looked at. Attack of seven, defense of four, but you're not going to be using them in the melee. Long range missiles, which is nice and effective against armor. I'm not going to go over the same points. You know that effective against armor is good. You know that long range missiles are good. And a missile attack of 12, pretty solid, but not amazing. So next up, we have the Sudanese gunners. Now we're talking. Hailing from all over Africa. Would have just thought they were hailing from Sudan, but whatever. I don't know much about this kind of stuff. Um, they are well trained troops. Now they have a missile attack of 16. But of course they're gunners, you know, you'd expect a musket or a gun or whatever it's called to have more of a punch to it than a bow and arrow, obviously. So, decent in the melee, 9 and 7 is better than some of the troops we previously looked at, but of course these guys are a missile troop. So missile attack of 16, effective against armour, which of course they're a gun, it would kind of be more effective than an arrow. Good morale, which is actually rare for a troop that is a missile troop which is nice they, if they do for some reason get caught up in the melee they're not going to collapse straight away like let's say these guys but of course the fact that they have little armor themselves means they are vulnerable to missiles shouldn't be too much of a problem could be in certain circumstances though then we have hand gunners so they are somewhat inaccurate capable of firing a powerful shot the good thing about them is that they can demoralize enemy troops because they make a loud noise when they shoot, which is good. Anything that lowers the opposition morale or boosts your morale is a good thing indeed because morale is so important. It really is important. Melee attack, sorry, missile attack of 13, which is pretty solid. For a gunner, probably less so, actually, thinking about it. there. I mean, other gunners for other factions have a lot higher missile attack if you look at my other faction guides. But the good thing about these guys, competent in the melee, so they're not going to collapse straight away. But 13 and 16 missile attack, that's the best that the Moors get up to, even in the late game. I've seen other factions with like 21 missile attack. So that's a little bit of an issue because in the late game you're going to fall behind. Have fun with that. Right, now we get on to the cavalry. And we start off with Arab cavalry. Light cavalry recruited from settled areas and well suited to taking on archers, light infantry, etc. So these guys, light cavalry, so they're fast. Basically, they're not good in a sort of long prolonged melee, but what they are good at is just chasing down routing troops or maybe flanking if you need some sort of flanking maneuver very, very quickly for someone to get over. Then the Arab cavalry are good, but the fact that they only have a defense of 13 and not an amazing attack means they're not going to survive in a long time, especially against someone like Spearman or whatever. Then we have the tu Tuareg Camel Spearman. Now, I've never been a big fan of camels, I'll be honest. In real life, or in Rome Total War, or in Medieval 2 Total War, which is the game I'm discussing right now. Never been a big fan, but the good thing about camels are they scare horses. So if you have a lot of opposition cavalry, then that's cool. But the thing is, you're going to be fighting factions that aren't really cavalry-based. The only cavalry-based faction... Well, there are a few cavalry-based factions, but for example, Russia is a cavalry-based faction. Well, you're not going to be fighting Russia probably forever. Maybe, you know, you probably won't ever be fighting them. So... I don't know how useful scaring horses is, but it could be useful in certain circumstances, particularly maybe if you're fighting a strong general. Attack of 11, defense of 10 is rather underwhelming. The thing I just don't like about camels are, even though they have a combat bonus in deserts, and these guys have good morale, which is nice, they're not very maneuverable. They tend to be less cooperative than a horse, but that's just my opinion. Maybe I just don't like camels, who knows. Then we have 
Grenadine Lancers, recruited in the Moorish Iberia. These troops are trained and well-equipped heavy cavalry. So we've got some heavy cavalry now. Not amazing heavy cavalry. Attack of 10, defense of 14. Good morale, and good morale on any cavalry is nice to see. Admittedly, that's relatively rare. Cavalry that can fight for a long time and not break is relatively rare in Total War games. So for the Grenadine Lancers to be able to do that, that's that's pretty cool. But they're a little bit underwhelming on the old attack, in my opinion. Then we have the General's Bodyguard. Now, these guys are obviously going to be good because they're defending the General. It's their job to be good. Handpicked to protect the General. 14 attack, 18 defense. You can see a much better defense, much better attack. They're well armored, very good stamina, good morale. Obviously, these guys are going to be good. But you can't just recruit them like anything. You have to have a general to have them. Which is a bit of a shame. But there you go. But you know obviously. Christian guard up next. 13 attack. 16 defense. 8 charge bonus. Which is pretty solid indeed. To boost that attack up to sort of more like 21. If you think about it. So actually a pretty solid troop. And as I said. Any troop fighting for a religion in this game. I like. Good morale. Powerful charge. Well armor. These guys will stand up to a long fight. These guys are pretty solid. I do like them indeed. Then we have Bodyguard, the late period Bodyguard. I don't know why they decided to wedge the Christian Guard in between the Bodyguard and late Bodyguard. That doesn't matter. Basically, they are more, they are a better armoured version of the previous Bodyguard we looked at because they have, you need to have better morale in the late game because you're going to be fighting gunners and so on and so forth. So, basically, your general's more safe or safer if they uh, have the late period Bodyguard, obviously. Then we have Desert Cavalry. Now these guys are the first missile cavalry we've come across. They are sort of like um, skirmishers with javelins. They are all right in the melee, but not really amazing. Eight attack, eight defense. They will suffer pretty quickly if you just charge them into a unit. But what they are good at is the missile attack, which is eight, which is pretty solid for a javelin unit. I'm not huge on the, the um, javelin cavalry, personally. I much prefer archer cavalry. But... Solid unit, and the fact that they are effective against armor, as I've discussed plenty of times in this video already, is a good fact. Then we move on to Grenadine Crossbow Cavalry. A nice bit of alliteration there. These troops combine the crossbow, favored by the Grenadine troops, with the Eastern tradition of mobile warfare. Not amazing in the melee, but they're not melee troops. They are missile-based troops. Missile tank of seven, pretty solid, and again, effective against armor, which is nice. Then we get on to Grenadine Jeanettes. I don't know how to say that, I'm sorry. Um, lightly armoured skirmishers armed with a javelin but even though they are lightly armoured they still have a defence of 13 which is pretty solid it's alright for jav cavalry it's not too bad and finally the camel gunners now this this is a unit I like I said I didn't like camels but a, a camel armed with a gun now now you're talking so mounted on the camel these units fight a powerful musket Attack of 8, defense of 6, they're not great in the melee, but what do you expect? But missile attack of 16 is pretty solid on a camel. I think that's probably the highest missile attack you're going to get on a camel in this game. So that's pretty cool. Long range missiles, again, on a camel, that's pretty cool. I like that. They scare horses, good morale. I quite like this unit. I mean, I'm not a big fan of camels, if I'm being honest, but as a late game unit, I, I, I quite like them. Now, um, I'm not going to discuss the... Um, the cannons and whatnot because I discussed that in my England faction guides. If you want to see stuff about trebuchets and bombards and grand bombards, go to the England faction guide. That's where I talked about it in detail. But what we'll do is we'll finally look at the Sudanese tribesmen. Uh, tribesmen from Africa armed with swords. Attack of 13, defense of 8. Pretty underwhelming, that's all I've got to say. They're all right, but they haven't even got good morale, so I'm not a big fan. Anyway, they are the Moor units, the Moorish units. They're decent in the early game, then they get a little bit underwhelming. That's my general opinion of them. Anyway, what we'll do now is we'll have a look at the little video that plays before the campaign, and we'll talk some campaign strategy. From African roots to conquest on the Iberian Peninsula. The Moors have established for themselves a reputation as fierce warriors. They are a people united by religion, yet divided by mistrust and rivalries. lands 
Kings and their warlords, though fierce, remain directionless. The strength of a mighty ruler is needed to unite them into the empire they could become. Okay, so here we are. This is the starting position for the Moors. You start off with two settlements in what is now modern-day Spain, Cordoba and Granada. Then we have, in what is North Africa, Marrakesh and Algiers. I think is how you say that. Monday Algeria, right? Um, so these are the four settlements you start off with. A pretty decent area. So what I'm going to do is, in order to explain better, basically, the campaign, I'm going to turn off the Fog of War. I don't normally play with the Fog of War off. But it's just so I can show you exactly who is around you and where exactly I'd expand. Right, so there we go. The fog of war is off. Let's start off with Spain. So in Spain we have, well, the Spanish, believe it or not, who have two settlements along here. We have the Portuguese who have settlement here and here. So a little bit isolated from each other, which is interesting. And then we have a rebel settlement, which is Zarago Zaragoza, I think that's how you say it, over here. And Valencia over here as well. So... A lot of potential to expand, particularly because there's just so much rebel territory around. Now, the most important, and this is pretty much common con uh, consensus, the most, if you want to go for Iberia, I'd go for this anyway, but if you want to go for the Iberian Peninsula, the most important place to go for first is to Toledo. I think that's how you say it. Now, the reason is, it's a castle. Now, um, that's important because it's got better defence. You can see that, You can see that, for example, Zaragoza is a town, so less defensible than Toledo. Now, you might think, well, it's, def it's well defended. Why would you want to go for it? Well, if you take it, it will cripple the Spanish. It will cripple the Spanish. And the good way to take Toledo is to put a jihad. Call a jihad on Toledo if you, you can. Because you're Islamic, you can do that. And then you'll get more support. You'll get crusading troops. And you'll be able to take it pretty early on. You then have crippled the Spanish. And you can then go for Lyon maybe. Or um, is that Lyon? I think Lyon is in France, right? Um, anyway, you can then go for the Spanish. Really, you know, go for the throat. Or you could go for Lisbon or whatever. I personally am not hugely bothered about taking the Spanish Peninsula. I'm less bothered about that. But I think taking Toledo is always a good start. And also there's potential to expand in the rebel settlements. Try and get these maybe before Portugal do. Because that would be quite nice. Zaragoza is really not that well defended, but the Portuguese will probably get there pretty quickly. That's the bad thing about it. Now over here, this is the more interesting bit. And this is the bit I'm more bothered about personally. I'm more bothered about. Now first of all, you have the secret settlement of Timbuktu. It's sort of a secret. I mean, this one's actually more secretive because I believe in order to see it in the campaign, you have to like sort of travel all the way like this. But Timbuktu, that's where the money is at. Now, it's a long way away from Marrakesh. I absolutely understand. It's going to take millions of years to get over there. And um, that's an agent. It's going to take millions of years. But trust me, Timbuktu, you get that, you're going to get more money than your factions. You already have a, a decent amount of money anyway. You're going to get more money than your rival factions. The reason is, lots of resources. Gold mines, ivory, slaves, gold mines, two gold mines. Um, more ivory, really good area for trading. You can see there, more gold, ivory. This region is really profitable. So taking Timbuktu, which is not super easy, but it's, it's, it's all right, you're going to get a lot of money in instantly, and it means you can really grow your economy as well as your faction early on. That's my opinion. Now, rather than focusing on Iberia, personally, I'd rather focus on Tunis and trying to get there before the Sicilians do. Now, the Sicilians who are over here in Palermo, um, they are more likely to get to Tunis than you first because there's not a lot of force in Algiers over here. And it's going to take a long while for anyone of the Moorish army from Marrakesh to get over. But personally, I like going for Tunis more than, the Spa than, than Spain. That's my personal opinion. The reason is these regions are super profitable. And what I personally like doing is getting Tunis early on and then going for Sicily. Going for Sicily, once you've got a bit of money from Timbuktu, taking Toledo, maybe taking a little bit of Spain, really going for Sicily is the next thing. Basically, even if you go for Spain, don't start going up through France. France is strong and also it's a long area to travel through. I would personally rather go through Sicily, get the money that belongs to Sicily. And the good thing about taking Sicily is it's an island, so it's a lot harder for troops to get over here. I know there's a walking place over here. And I know obviously you can just get a boat, but it's more defensible naturally because of the sort of uh, landscape than 
than most other places. So you've got a really good defensible sort of heartland over here, which nobody's... Who, what faction is going to be going for Timbuktu? No one. You can just... Once you take it, you can leave it pretty much empty and just get money from it. It's like a massive gold mine, right? But I, I, I like going for the Sicilians pretty quickly. But it's up to you. If you don't want to, go for Iberia. Spain will be weakened by the fact you've taken Toledo early on. The Portuguese are isolated and trapped between you either side. And then you can get the rebel settlements shouldn't be too difficult to take. France should leave you alone. They're going to be going for the rebel settlements. Probably having some trouble with um, the English or the Holy Roman Empire, whatever. So you've got a good opportunity to establish this as a sort of stronghold and then you've got these mountains over here the alps which will be a again another natural defense against further opposition that's my main advice timbuktu toledo and sicily now you're gonna have to make some decisions because you can't go for all three at the same time you haven't got enough force you cannot spread your force three different directions massively so timbuktu is important and then maybe iberia and then go for sicily that's probably the order i'd go probably I, i'd say actually in hindsight one two three maybe well, you can split up your force. You don't have to all go to Timbuktu either, you know. So you can split up your force, but something like that. You get what I'm saying? Focus on the Iberian Peninsula would be pretty cool. It's up to you. It's a sort of matter of subjectivity. You have to kind of see what is going on. But these are the important areas to go for. Is Spain, Sicily, Timbuktu. They're the three important areas to go for. I wouldn't be going through France, for example. So that's basically it. I hope that was a little bit of help, a little bit of an insight into where it expand northwards basically and then sort of going towards tunis i would like to get tunis before the sicilians did it's up to you anyway thank you very much for watching i'm sorry i didn't make a faction guide in a while i've been busy etc etc but i'll be back with more pretty soon the next one will be spain incidentally because that's what i promised and then after that will be the holy roman empire because that's what i promised so thank you very much for watching and i'll see you around